With that, we will get going. We have a great panel today uh, to focus on all manner of renewable energy projects on the next next generation of what's happening in energy uh, in Virginia. Uh, first up, I'd like to introduce Steve Bowen. Uh, Mr. Bowen graduated from Newport News Shipbuilding Apprentice School in 1987 as a journeyman welder, and then later became a master plumber and HVAC mechanic. He's now in the 30th year of his career at uh, an Ottaway Campus Facilities Manager at the Piedmont Geriatric Hospital and the Virginia Center for Behavioral Rehabilitation Center. Um, Steve entered the political arena in 2008 and is now serving his third term on the Nottaway County Board of Supervisors representing the 1st District in Burkeville, Virginia. Uh, Mr. Bowen has participated in the Baker Chairman's Institute, is a graduate of the Certified Supervisors Program, and serves as Baker's Chairman for the Nominating and Economic Development and Planning Steering Committees. Also, he's presently serving on the Nottaway County Planning Commission, Economic Development Committee, and the Piedmont Regional Jail Authority. Um, we also have with us today a man who needs no introduction, but uh, Delegate Terry Kilgore. Uh, Delegate Kilgore represents the first House District in the House of Delegates uh, since he was first elected in 1993. In fact, just this past Tuesday, Delegate Kilgore was elected to his 13th term in the House. So congratulations. As a delegate, uh, Mr. Kilgore represents Scott and Lee counties, parts of Wise County, and the city of Norton. Um, he serves as chairman of the House Commerce and Labor Committee and is a member of the House Courts of Justice Committee and House Rules Committee. Doug Kilgore serves on numerous boards and organizations throughout the Commonwealth, including uh, the Chairman of the Tobacco Regional Revitalization Commission, the Coal and Energy Commission, and Southwest Virginia Health Authority. He also serves on the Appalachian Region Interstate Compact Commission, Southwest Virginia Cultural Heritage Foundation, and a number of other. He wears a lot of hats. And then finally, we have John Warren, Director of the Virginia Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy. John Warren was appointed director of the department in August of 2015. He holds a degree in mechanical engineering from Virginia Tech, a master's in public administration from VCU. Mr. Warren's career began in industrial construction, but his mechanical engineering background led him to Henrico County, where he served in facilities management and was tasked with reducing the energy footprint of county buildings. He then served as DMME's director of energy from 2000 to 2007, followed by private sector work in the alternative fuels and green chemicals industry. So, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Steve Bowen, and hopefully we have a great discussion. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. And when I heard <coughs> Delegate Terry Kilgore, then he has, I wish he 13, is on, am I to look like that if I stay with politics? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, he's got a good personality. I love talking to him. Um, again, my name is Steve Bowen, and I, I want to talk about my position at Piedmont Hospital um, a little bit more. Um, what had happened, we had a gentleman come to us back in 2006, Representative Gene Tech. And, and the superintendent came to me and he said, Steve, there's a man who wants to burn grass in a bull. Well, if you tell a, man, a, a fellow who's born in the 60s that somebody who wanted to burn grass, what do you think I'm thinking? <laughs> what is he trying to get rid of? And so he brought, he brought me some. And as, as my mom taught me, I had to smell it first. <laughs> Not that I know it held it, and don't, don't go back. <laughs> split it off, but I knew what it smelled like. And, uh, but anyway, it's not native warm season grass. And to, to kind of describe what we do at Piedmont Hospital, uh, in the wintertime, uh, we even don't have to burn them too fuel because we burn sawdust during the summer, but sawdust in the winter, what does it do? It gets wet. And it's about 45, 50% moisture. So um, we had this idea, we tried it out, put it in the boil, it worked. Um, and then this is when I had to start trying to figure out how I convert cats as a board of supervisor. Um, we went into a collaborative partnership with the county. The county had tobacco money, um, and we built a processing plan for FDC. Uh, they rent that from us. Um, Piedmont Hospital is one of our biggest employers in the county, so we were trying to help the economy part of it also. So it was a win-win for everyone. And. I think I'll just let the video play itself, and then I'll let Delegate Terry Gilmore take over after that. But that's kind of, this, this will kind of tell the story a little bit. Basically, the project started at Virginia Tech uh, with the Conservation Management Institute back in 2005. Jeff Walton had the idea and we began looking at the opportunity to develop uh, switch rights as a non-fuel for use in the same time. The goal was to get to the 2008 and the grass planted primarily to enhance quail habitat. The economic opportunity to do it in a circuit on the combined project and addresses the need for possible there to reduce their costs, to reduce their greenhouse gases, and address some of them. So, also, the Virginia Tech Grass Company has pushed more money out into the community. We um, should push the hand up. The fuel is fantastic. Uh, the, the statistics that we see off the fuel, uh, BD 
uh, seen output per ton than this, it's a lot uh, greater than we ever expected uh, that was ever shown in the literature. This project would be absolutely nowhere if it were not for Piedmont Hospital, if it were not for Nottoway County and those people, and the Tobacco Commission, and also FDC and the landowners. And so it's truly a cooperative farm to fuel project. Uh, without any piece, it would not exist. With the fuel oil that cost fluctuated so much, I would not know from year to year, depending on what the weather was, how much I was going to spend by using a more consistent cost-based fuel source, the native one season grass, I've been able to budget more consistently and know what my expenses were going to be from one year to the next. Sawdust is 40, 50 percent more Switchgrass is under 15% moisture. The way switchgrass became very competitive with sawdust in, in the wintertime is because of that moisture. You can't burn the water. During January of 2011 through February, we had a 44-day successful burn. And the 44-day uh, period, FTC actually put in our economy between 200 to $250,000. They stayed in hotels, they ate in Nottoway County, in Blackstone, Virginia. They uh, were burning fuel. When the tractors broke down, they were buying materials here. Not only did the FEC put money back into our community, um, instead of burning oil in those 44 days, we saved $44,000 in those 44 days of the company. What we're really talking about is that there's multi-stakeholders and everybody gets a benefit out of it. And for landowners, it's a new revenue stream. It's uh, putting land cover on the ground that captures carbon, which is good for everybody. Uh, it reduces sedimentation into the streams that are adjacent, which is good for water quality for everybody. We have 10 year contracts, so it's locked in a fixed, fixed price revenue. It's coming in and then that they can count on. They can pay their taxes, put some money in the bank, and be able to sustain that heritage that that landowner family may have on that piece of land. Uh, not only Bob Fields has offered um, landowners and farmers uh, another avenue for their uh, unused agricultural land without, uh, without substitute productive farmland. It has provided a renewable green energy and it has helped uh, one of our largest employers in the county uh, with, their, with their fuel costs. And because that employer is also a state agency, it helps us all in this tax plan. To see both facilities succeed and grow, if not grow, sustain, um, and still provide service at cost to the taxpayers of Virginia that they can accept and they can see the program that is not only giving back in other ways, uh, then that protects this campus and the jobs in this community and the local growers that are, that are growing switch grass. That's a win for everyone. Certainly the biofuels focus and the environmental advantages of that was a start. And it is, it is still evolving. The idea that it would be something usefully grown here in Southside Virginia and be a productive crop where other crops like tobacco were no longer viable when we first went into this endeavor with FPC, I had to think about the changes that went on um, in my life from a person who was born in the 60s. When we were up, we didn't wear seatbelts. And then my children come along and they said, Daddy, you need to put seatbelt. And later on, um, they started recycling. And I thought, I'm not putting all those aluminum cans and taking them somewhere. And they said, but you're saving the earth. And they changed my children, and now I have a granddaughter who's four years old, um, has changed my um, way of thinking of how we need to take care of, of, um, of our world and for the generations to come. And so that really affected me of saying, to, you know, when, when we started thinking about burning switchgrass, I thought maybe this is something we need to try, at least try, and see what will happen. What's the worst thing could happen? The worst thing could happen, it wouldn't work. But it did work, and we made it work. And we need to figure out how to make things work in the future so these young people can have the environment, can have the pleasure of going outdoors and 
and sin, a, a pond that's not polluted, a field that's not polluted, and um, and so they can share with their children as I grew up with, and we owe that to the next generation. Steve. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but uh, it is good to be here on Terry Kilgore and uh, good to be here uh, uh, to talk about renewable energy. I was uh, uh, telling my age here just a little bit, but I was appointed in uh, 1997 uh, by Speaker Moss. At that time, we were talking to an energy subcommittee uh, in the uh, General Assembly. And since that time, uh, I've uh, dealt with energy about every year uh, since I've been in the uh, General Assembly. And uh, over that time, renewable energy has become more and more and more a part of the mix as it relates to uh, our electricity grid. You know, we, we're dealing right now, what we're dealing with, our electricity grid, uh, if, you, if you think about the grid, the grid was built uh, to put electricity out. Uh, you know, it wasn't really built to take electricity in, and that's been some of the problems that we've had uh, when dealing with uh, folks who have solar, uh, folks who have wind uh, turbines and things of that nature, how to get that back on the grid, and what price to pay uh, for that energy coming back on the grid because uh, the uh, power, the incumbent power, uh, whether it, uh, that be uh, AMP or Dominion or one of our co-ops, uh, they have put uh, money uh, into the poles, into the wires, into the uh, gener uh, you know the generation uh, capacity. Uh, to uh, make that work. So that's some of the problems that we've had uh, going forward. But uh, there is such a big demand uh, for renewable energy now. If, you, if you're out, and a lot of you all are out recruiting a lot of uh, uh, folks to come to your county, especially data centers. Data centers really want uh, renewable energy. They want that to be part of their mix. So it's uh, incumbent upon us uh, when I say us, I'm, I'm talking about everybody in this room to try to come up with a strategy that uh, would, uh, for, you know, first of all, allow renewable energy. But also, the main thing that we have to allow is we have to have that reliability because when folks, uh, the worst thing that can happen when folks go to uh, flip that switch, the lights doesn't, the light uh, doesn't come on or something like that. So that would be a bad. Uh, situation and they're going to call you all as boards of supervisors or uh, probably their legislator or uh, the governor's office or somebody and somebody's uh, going to have to uh, explain what's going on so uh, you know the uh, reliability is a, a big issue when it comes to uh, uh, renewables and uh, you know because the sun doesn't shine every day the uh, wind doesn't blow every day but uh, you know there are some ways that we can work uh, together to uh, make it uh, to make those renewable energies uh, more reliable. Uh, you know, one thing that you all are going to have to deal with as counties, uh, as, as administrators, as zoning officials, are you know these big solar farms that may be coming uh, uh, to your counties. Uh, how, where do they go? What you know? How many acres are they? Uh, do they have a special? You know, it's all, all kinds of different questions that you all are, are going to have to uh, answer as it comes there. And uh, you know, in Southwest Virginia, we're embracing renewable energy. Uh, believe it or not, you know, I, I represent the, the coal mining area of, of uh, Southwest Virginia. I see some of my uh, board members uh, here today. And uh, last year, about this time, uh, we had a meeting with our, our friends at Dominion, and uh, we uh, talk, started talking to them about a hydro pump storage uh, facility in the coal fields in Southwest Virginia. So we decided we'd come up here. The biggest one in the world is here in Bath County, Virginia. So we thought we would come up here and look at this hydro pump storage facility. Well, we picked the day that was the coldest day of the year. It was like eight degrees outside. And uh, this was uh, just an amazing uh, opportunity uh, for uh, Senator Chaik and myself and Delegate Pillion, uh, who are all Southwest they're both Southwest Virginia legislators also to come here uh, to uh, look at the uh, hydro pump storage. And John is going to go through more of that as we go on. But basically, it's just a, uh, it's a, a big batter. Uh, you've got a reservoir, uh, two, reser two reservoirs, upper reservoir, lower reservoir, 
for a big drop and has power needed, That's uh, which power would be needed probably by the mornings and uh, uh, early afternoon to, you know, to 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. And we just have to have all this energy now because everybody's got all these devices that they have to have charged, that they have to, you know, watching TV. Have, how many of you have four or five TVs going at the same time in your house? That always happens at my house. I'll be going in and nobody's watching the TV, but it's on. And I'm saying, uh, and they say, oh, we're going back. And I'm like, oh my gosh, turn that TV off. But uh, that's why we have such a demand uh, for uh, energy. And, and this hydro pump storage is an ability to allow uh, energy to be stored and then released. And that's why it's so, so important as it relates to renewable energy, because renewable energy, uh, you know, uh, right now uh, you may be having solar energy being created, but, you know, four or five o'clock on a winter day, you're probably not going to in some of the mountainous areas. I saw some of that plant farmland you had there. I'd like to have some yeah. flat farmland <laughs> in Southwest Virginia, but, uh, you know, this is a, uh, you know, these uh, facilities are not uh, inexpensive. They're uh, close, you know, a billion, billion and a half dollars, depending on the size uh, of the facilities. But one thing that's been very exciting about Southwest Virginia and the, and the counties down there, we have entered into a revenue sharing uh, agreement, uh, or Every, all the boards have passed, they haven't reached the agreement yet, but they're going to. They're going to. So, uh, 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 that all counties in the coastal area would be able to uh, uh, receive some of the tax revenue off of this hydro pump storage. Right now, that uh, it's been narrowed down, the pump storage has been narrowed down to either Wise County uh, and, and the Wise County uh, site is a, a, you know, it's exciting about it because what that site would do, it would use uh, abandoned, an old abandoned mine water, uh, underground mine, uh, the old bullet mine there, and uh, under, it goes all the way under the town of Appalachia. I don't know if anybody's, other than the folks uh, from there, that anybody's been to Appalachia, there's a mine that goes all the way under, and there's about five billion gallons of water under that, uh, uh, in that mine site that we could use uh, for uh, a hydro pump storage station, which would uh, keep from having to build uh, uh, one of the reservoirs or one of the lakes, so that would be uh, hopefully be a cost savings. Uh, still doing a lot of research on that. I know that uh, we have uh, Virginia Tech, uh, uh, Dr. Carmus is helping us a lot on that. Actually, has has traveled to Germany uh, to uh, check on the. Uh, uh, they're doing the campaign in Germany right now uh, using an abandoned mine site. So that's one of the sites, and the other site uh, is over in Tazewell, uh, Virginia, uh, Tazewell County, Virginia. And it would be more of uh, a site, a sort, of, sort of like Bath County, just a, a tr traditional hydro pump storage site. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, but another fact about the hydro pump storage is it's going to be operated uh, under the legislation uh, to be operated by uh, renewable energy. So the, the plant is going to run off of renewable energy, which means an opportunity for those areas in southwest Virginia. It doesn't have to be right, the renewable energy doesn't have to be right against the plant. Uh, you know, it opens up an opportunity for solar farms, wind farms, and things of that nature uh, out uh, in the coal fields. But uh, energy's changing, uh, but still, uh, you know, and I think John will tell you this in just a minute, still, uh, you know, uh, coal and uh, natural gas are very important in our uh, energy uh, uh, as we deliver energy uh, to folks, and natural gas is really uh, has been really cheap uh, over the last uh, few years, and that's been one of the reasons that it is really uh, being used a lot more because uh, you know with the, the price the way it is, it's uh, it's just it makes sense to use the cheapest price. But uh, anyway, I'm going to turn it over to John. He's got some slides and. Uh, uh, I'm going to do it from there. No, I'm going to sit right here. Okay, I'm going to hand this to you. Now. Thank you. I think I got this. Yeah, put this I got right here. Thank you. So, yeah, I've got quite a few slides, folks, and I just want to start off talking about um, Virginia's energy mix. We've got a diverse energy mix, but there's some areas where um, we could improve. Let's see. I got it now. So. You know, we really do embrace an all of the above strategy. We got a pretty good mix of all the traditional energy sources of uh, 
nuclear gas and coal, there's really not much fuel oil used for electricity generation unless you're in Alaska where you, um, you can transport it long distances on barges and tanks. But in most of the U.S., oil is not a big electricity fuel source. In the renewable energy side, we are really growing on the solar side. Wind has not really emerged yet in Virginia for a couple of reasons I'll get to. And now we're going to talk about pump storage hydro. Again, biofuel in this case is more for, uh, for transportation purposes, but we're really talking about electricity. Why should we continue to increase uh, energy capacity and diversity? One reason is we're, um, we use more electricity than we generate. So we don't want to have to import electricity from other states. It's not economical. It's not in the best interest of Virginia. Um, so we got economic development opportunities. We've got energy security opportunities. Um, renewables can provide a hedge against volatile fuel costs that are typically commodities. And, uh, and we can do good things for the environment and reduce carbon emissions. There's uh, Virginia's current electricity mix. Again, as you can see, fuel oil, not a whole lot there. Natural gas, um, we're heavy as far as natural gas is concerned relative to the U.S. average. Coal, you might be interested to see that we're actually a little light compared to the U.S. average. A lot of folks might not realize this, but about 70% of Virginia's coal actually goes into Met coal, and we're very fortunate to have that high-quality coal to be able to do that. Nuclear, of course, because of the two plants, Surrey and North Anna, we're heavy there. Renewables, we do have some ground to make up and some clear opportunity there. Um, there is a slide that just kind of reflects what I said, that our generation is less than our needs, and so we have uh, net electricity, and we'd like to be able to close that gap. And it is slow, slowly closing. So um, we're going to talk about solar wind and pump storage hydro, and then uh, couldn't do this without using a megawatt source, megawatts and megawatt sources. And this commercial PACE program is a new program for Virginia that is basically sponsored by localities. And so I thought there might be some interest in the room to, to learn a little bit more about that. It's, um, it's been very successful in a couple of other states. It's just starting off here in Virginia. So that's just a visual on how solar has grown in Virginia over the last few years. And there's a graph that reflects the same thing. Um, Q417, of course, um, we're still in the middle of, but that's what's projected as a pretty big jump in the last year. As you can see, between 2015 and 2017, there's been a significant jump in Virginia with respect to utility scale solar. One thing interesting to note here is utility scale solar has been going on in Maryland and North Carolina for a while and the industry really developed um, in those two states and Virginia kind of became an island between those two states and really at this point I think it's worked to our benefit if you hear the, the old saying that uh, Pioneers take the arrows and settlers take the land. Well, I think North Carolina <laughs> took some arrows for us with respect to cost because to build that industry up costs a lot of money. So that industry got built up around us and Virginia really was primed to take advantage of that. And I think we're doing a good job of that. Got some, got some opportunities to go, but yeah, we were, we were in a good spot to be able to take advantage of the solar industry that had developed around us and that was looking for a new market area. And so there were some things happened that provided that momentum that you saw in those uh, two visuals. Um, there was a law enacted uh, setting 500 megawatts in the public interest and then a couple of the utilities started to put together renewable energy RFP and, and to deploy renewable energy solar energy projects. And uh, here is a list of Dominion. There are, they are clearly the most active. And you can see that they've got a number of projects in a number of different locations. One thing to notice there is that the typical size is 20 megawatts is kind of what I would call a cookie cutter size. It's one of those where you can get it into the distribution system. Um, 
and it also hinges on some of the tax exemptions. So when you get up to 80 megawatts, those are those are relatively rare. I think there's some in the queue that are that size, but what you'll see for most of these is they're in that 20 megawatt range. If they're 80 megawatts, they might not be contiguous. They might be co-located or located close to each other on 20 acre plots. Um, but those are a little bit more on the rare side. 20 megawatts is gonna take between 100 and 150 acres for y'all, those of y'all that are trying to wonder how much, if we have solar farms coming to our localities, what kind of land mass are we really talking about? And there's the continued list of dominion. These are the ones that are currently under development. So some other initiatives that were passed, and I'm going to get into this because I know this is a, uh, an issue that a lot of localities have that, that might discourage solar development, but it's the law that was enacted that puts an exemption on the machinery and tools tax, the M&T tax. And the level of that exemption, of course, depends on how big the system is and when it's built. And it's it could be considered a deterrent, but just some facts that I want to put out there for those of y'all that might be confronted with these projects and might otherwise not want them because you're going to lose the tax exemption. I mean, you're going to lose the M&T tax. I don't know if you've heard of the cost of community service studies. Can you talking to the mic? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Um, the cost of awesome. community service studies. They. Um, there are studies that are done that help determine how much it costs to provide services based on different types of land uses. There's been a number of studies done by the American Farmland Trust and the USDA. Some of those have been done on counties in Virginia. This doesn't really apply to, to a lot of the rural counties, but the, the uh, general outcome was that for residential, anyway, it costs more in services than the revenue that's generated from, from that type of development. There's a metric that reflects that, that this is, this is kind of an average, that it's going to cost $1.16 for every dollar for residential, but then when you get down to uh, commercial and agriculture, the cost of county services based on the revenue collected is much less. And so there at the bottom is some of those Virginia counties that were included in the study, and they pretty much reflect that U.S. average. When you get into the commercial and agriculture, you can see there's some anomalies there, but for the most part, um, uh, they consistently cost less than the revenue they generate. So there was nothing specifically done with solar, but you could draw some conclusions. One thing is that um, solar, once it's installed on the acres, it, it doesn't require any service. So there, there's no cost to the county to maintain or, or, or to have that um, in their locality. And so the cost of services provided really compares to agriculture or maybe even better than agriculture because when you think about a solar farm there's not the runoff issues there's not the nutrient problems there's not erosion problems and one thing that's important to to note is that these systems their equipment and they're constructed pretty quickly and after the term is over if there's a, if there's a, a need a desire to return that to farmland they can be decommissioned relatively quickly and relatively easy. So it's not a permanent construction scenario. You don't have a big building or a bridge that has to be taken down. It's, it's a piece of equipment that gets put on the site and it can just as easily be removed from the site. Um, so the cost and revenue balance for, for considering something like that would be even more advantageous if there's areas farmlands that are underutilized or non-productive farmlands, um, open fields, open farmlands. And while the exemption applies to the M&T, it doesn't apply to all M&T, so you're not getting uh, no revenue from that. There, there's a schedule, it's a little complicated. I think I got that on the next slide. Nope. Yeah, this is it. So 
this is a little convoluted. The bottom line is after 2024, there's not going to be any tax exemption. So it's only for a period of time at sunsets. The only um, system that's going to get a permanent exemption is the ones that are five megawatts or less. Again, five megawatts is going to take maybe 30 acres. You're not talking about a huge land mass for five acres. And then <clears throat> For most of everything else, it's going to be 80%. So you're still going to get 20% of the M&T taxes up until 2024, and after that, it'll be 100%. So it's not a complete exemption of the M&T taxes. And uh, I'm going to move on to the permit by rule process. The permit by rule is the way that most of these are getting uh, their air and operating permits. DEQ administers this and it, it offers some certainty to developers because it's a, it's a very specific process that's not held up by SEC hearings and schedules and other stuff. The, the local government, the approval of the local government is the gating item. So really nothing else happens if the local government doesn't approve it. There's a bunch of other things that have to happen in addition to that, but that is the gating item. What doesn't have to happen is that the developer doesn't have to get a certificate of public necessity from the corporation commission. The legislation from last year increased the size eligible from 100 to 150. I really haven't seen projects in that range. Not to say that there aren't some, but again, most of them, most of the larger ones are in that 80 megawatt range, and most of the rest are smaller than that. Um, let's see. 74 notices of intent into the PBRQ, a lot of those won't get built. So a lot of those projects go into the queue, they go start to get into the approval process, and then, and then they fade away. 13 have been granted. Um, the total projected PBR megawatt, that's based on 74, so again, that probably will not happen. And the number of acres, again, is based on um, if all of those were to happen. So this map, um, you know, it's, Virginia's open for business. What you can see from this is that the sun shines everywhere in Virginia. And so there's really not um, any one locality that's a lot more advantaged than any other. There's, there's sites that are more advantageous for solar than others. But I would say that just about every county in Virginia has sites that accommodate a very efficient solar project. Um, distributed generation, this is getting down to the small stuff, like what you might put on the roof of your garage. Net metering, one megawatt or less. Um, and that's gotten very popular too. It's, it's really grown in popularity, mainly again because the costs have become so competitive and it's, uh, it's becoming um, a, a lot more affordable to folks that aren't just looking for um, doing a niche project on their property and making a statement. This is really becoming a option for the everyday consumer. And as with utility scale solar, you can see that popularity, how it's grown in the last few years based on the rate of that curve. So if you start looking around 2014, I believe that's, yeah, 200 sets down to about 283% increase in that mid range since 2014, which is, is pretty significant. And I think that's going to continue to, uh, to rise. What, what happens with net metering is you you actually displace the kilowatt hours that are on your meter. So you get the full cost reduction of what your utility would otherwise cost. And during times of um, when you're generating more electricity than your house might be using, then your meter can actually spin backwards and take um, kilowatts off. So it's, uh, it's um, if you can get the installation at an affordable price, it really does help with your electricity costs. 
There's a lot of creative partnerships that are starting to take place and, uh, and help grow solar energy. These are, again, on the larger scale utility scale. I don't know if anybody saw this in the news. It's been very big in the news with the Facebook announcement that they're partnering with Dominion. They'll make the largest single solar power purchase in Virginia. And the utility is going to expand its portfolio in order to meet the needs of a million square foot of Facebook space, which is a pretty big space. So that, that in and of itself is a single project that will have a big impact on solar deployment. Um, the Microsoft is, uh, that's about a, a, a year or so um, old, but that was another public-private partnership where Microsoft uh, agreed to buy the Rex, and that helped finance and make that project possible. Community solar is something that has uh, been taken off in other states. It's been a little bit slower in Virginia. The, the idea is if you don't want to have a solar panel on your roof or you can't afford a solar panel on your roof, but your community could all pitch in and go in on a system that it would be co-owned amongst um, a group of, of, of buyers or customers. And there are some programs that are being initi initiated in Virginia that will allow for and promote community <coughs> solar. They're not the traditional ones that have been used in other states, but I think it's a really good start. And people will be able to subscribe in these community solar programs and to be able to purchase green power for their homes without having <coughs> panels on their site, on their roof, or in their backyard. <coughs> Yeah, those projects are underway in both Dominion and, and Appalachian service territories. And then the small agricultural generator program, that allows farmers to uh, install generation assets on their farms and then actually sell that back to the utility using a, using a regulated rate schedule. Um, this is one of those recent innovations in solar that's really helping to, I would say the small to mid to even large scale customers and they're called power purchase agreements. Um, the innovation there is really not in the technology, it's really in the relationship between the developer and the customer. And it's a way for a developer to install and own a site and sell customers electricity based on what's metered and provided. So it's very similar to buying electricity from your utility, but instead of buying it from your utility off the grid from a conventional generation asset, you're buying it from a developer who has installed a solar system. So you're paying cents per kilowatt hour instead of so many dollars per kilowatt installed. And you're not paying the capital or the upfront cost, you're just paying for electricity that's delivered to your meter. Um, the agreements are typically 20 years, and that's a long time. Uh, the, some of them can be more complicated than others. One of the complications that the Commonwealth has had, that some of y'all might have been involved with, is the, is the difference between buying electricity for so many cents a kilowatt hour, a service contract like you have with your utility, and, uh, and the financial folks that, um, that look at these as capital leases. If you buy a piece of, a, or if you, excuse me, if you rent a piece of equipment, say you rented a diesel gen set and had it put on your site, and you were just leasing it on a monthly basis, your financial folks might say, we have to recognize that on our balance sheet, we have to, if it's, if it's a publicly funded customer, then that brings up public debt implications. Um, we really think that PPAs can be structured to be service contracts. We're working with the Department of Accounts to try and get that straight now, but I think that is the bottom line. And the localities, a lot of localities have already taken that position. And there's just some things that you have to avoid in order to make sure that they're service contracts and not consider capital leases. And these are the basic ones that you only pay for delivered kilowatt hours. You can't have a take or pay clause in your agreement where if you don't take electricity, you're going to have to pay the supplier, the developer anyway, some balance due anyway. 
Um, you can't control the dispatch. It's all in the developers, under the developer's authority. And uh, either the equipment is decommissioned at the end of the term or you, uh, the owner can purchase, the customer can buy it at a fair market value. There can be no discount. So those are the main things. There's a lot of other more complicated ones, but the bottom line is you can stay away from capital leases. You can structure these power purchase agreements to be service contracts and not have to show them as debt, not have to um, go through the public debt scenario in order to do those agreements. So yeah, they're becoming more and more popular and I see this as a really good mechanism for localities. If you want to put uh, solar panels on your school, I think uh, we got uh, Albemarle, Middlesex, there's some guys in here that I see that are doing some of those projects. Right now Bath County has and Bath County, yeah. It's a, it's, it's a really good option. So yeah, maybe some of these folks in here in the room can uh, can talk to y'all and tell y'all about the benefits of, of PPAs and get into more details of how those work. Um, one example is uh, uh, in the Richmond area, the RBA Solar Fund um, projects, if they're eligible, can get grants to cover a lot of the administrative costs and, and understand how they work. And again, power purchase agreement is the mechanism. You're buying in the power that's delivered to the meter. You're not buying panels. And um, hopefully we'll get about $12 million of new solar in the um, Richmond region. The eligibility is you have to be in one of these 13 jurisdictions. And uh, there's the list of the uh, types of grant recipients. And got a little bit of a short fuse. There's the um, website but the November 17 deadline is a letter it's a you know one or two paragraph letter so if you're really interested in looking at this it can't hurt to put in a letter so I encourage any of y'all are in the 13 counties that are interested in something like that to go visit that website and talk to Tony right there in the middle section he can, he can help you out with that as well um, because we were such of, of a captive market for the industry that had developed around us, we are one of the fastest growing solar job markets in the country. And here's just some metrics on, on how that has worked out, over 3,000 jobs and 65% growth. That's pretty impressive. And again, I think there's, there's probably some more, more room to grow there. Um, here's something that's interesting for localities the group and group there every year the general assembly and i'm sure delegate kilgore can can commiserate with this because people would just come with all sorts of legislation about renewable energy and it just becomes overwhelming and you have to deal with just this massive amounts of of, of, of proposed bills and so last year they developed this Rubin group, and it was supposed to bring all the stakeholders together and in an attempt to consolidate potential legislation around some key areas of renewable energy. And so that happened last year, and some of the stuff that got enacted last year, like increasing um, the PDR from 100 to 150, was results of that group. Well, this group has got. Um, a new set of agenda items, and one of them is land use, deals with land use. And so here are the four things, I got two on this slide, two, two on the next that deal with land use. And um, the first one is that it would allow a substantial accord determination to be combined with a special or conditional use request unless a local zoning ordinance provides otherwise. Um, the second one is something I think that's been a battle for homeowners that have been interested in solar projects ever since people started putting panels on the roof, and that's homeowners associations. And so I think this is one of those that's trying to, to put an end to that, to the, to the debate between the homeowners associations and the homeowners on whether or not you can have solar panels on your roof. Of course, even if that happens, it would not override the local ordinances on um, setbacks and you know historical preservation and that kind of stuff. Those would still apply. Um, again, if you're an agricultural property owner 
unless the local zoning or local zoning ordinance provides otherwise, you can put um, solar panels on your farm, and the same with commercial or industrial property. And so the I'll go back the Rubin Group uh, at the top. They're they're meeting and they're talking about these issues. So I believe there's a website for this group. If any of y'all are interested, then you can go visit that website. And they have these these meetings are open to the public. They're stakeholder meetings, and and if you're interested in knowing more, you can uh, find out the schedule on those and maybe go and attend one of those meetings. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about wind energy because it's very regional. There's not a whole lot of places where you can put it. I know we've got representatives all over Virginia here, but the, one of the most exciting things we've got going now is that there's a there's a couple of lease areas off of Virginia's coast, and we've got one of the or actually the largest offshore wind developer in Europe that is partnering with Dominion to try and put a couple of test turbines up in the research area in order to inform on how to best develop the larger commercial area and, uh, and get some offshore wind business in Virginia. The reason this is big in Virginia, I think, is that the offshore wind industry is going to develop up and down the East Coast. It's going to start in the Northeast. It's already starting up in Maine and New York. Um, right now, all the materials and equipment, the the nasals, the towers, the foundation, the blades, they all have to come over from Europe. There's no manufacturing, there's no industry here in Virginia. Um, a lot of this involves the maritime industry. A lot of this requires ports and port facilities. Um, the anchor tenant, if you're going to build a shopping center and you want a Walmart or food line, the anchor tenant of the wind industry is the foundation fabricator, the ones that put in the big lattice structures that actually attach to the seafloor. Um, there's only going to be enough business for one of those on the East Coast. And one of them needs to be on the East Coast because they can't bring all these foundations over from Europe. So the first couple will come over to start developing up in the Northeast. The Norfolk port is the best port on the East Coast. If we can get one of these foundation fabricators to come and locate in Norfolk, then a lot of the other business will come. It won't be, it won't be business just for Virginia offshore wind. It will support the entire U.S. East Coast development. And so that would be a really big win for Virginia from an economic development standpoint. We're actively working with some of those folks now to uh, to gain their interest in, in Norfolk and the Norfolk ports. Wouldn't some of those foundations be like what we do with bridges? They're very, very um, specifically engineered for offshore okay. wind. When you think about the, the, the tidal yeah. forces and stuff like that, they, they need to twist and they need to bend, and so they're, uh, they're, they're very specifically designed. And basically it's a lattice system that goes up from the sea floor to about the ocean floor, and then they put a transition piece and then a tower, a monopole. And a lot of the monopoles and stuff like that, definitely the manufacturing in the U.S. Right. could adapt and adjust to that. So that's real exciting that, that Virginia, if we could land the, the foundation fabricator and be the, be the hub, the industry hub for U.S. East Coast offshore land. This just talks a little bit more about it. the commercial lease is 112,000 acres and it's big enough to put in enough turbines to where we could have uh, 2,000 megawatts of energy off the off the shore of Virginia. Um, the uh, the uh, dong is actually Worstead now, but this is just a visual of how that works: the turbine, um, the substation, and then the onshore landing. And this is just their next steps in Virginia. What they're planning to do, looking at establishing, actually they've established an office in Richmond, and looking at exploring Norfolk and the Norfolk ports. The other onshore wind is uh, right down the road in Bogotot County. Rocky Forge has been at this for a while. It's being done by a company called Apex. And still looking to try and find off takers. They're still developing their 
um, their site and their technology. They've got some new turbines that they think that they might be able to do this with less than 25, but this could be Virginia's first onshore wind project. Uh, pump storage hydro. Now, uh, Delegate Kilgore mentioned this. What I like to say about this, I didn't coin this term, but I like it. It's the ultimate battery. Pump storage hydro really represents the ultimate battery. When you think about it, it doesn't require any rare earth minerals, doesn't require disposal. Batteries are heavy, logistics and moving them from China or wherever they are manufactured. So, so there's a lot of reasons to really look hard at pump storage hydro. And with respect to pairing it with renewable energy, we've talked about wind and solar. You know, solar only generates electricity when the sun's shining. If you can, if you can pair that solar with uh, the ultimate battery, then you can have continuous energy supply, and you're not relying on other unknown sources. Um, so right now, this is an interesting statistic that pump storage hydro is actually 97% of the total domestic storage capacity. So batteries have got a, a little bit, but um, they got a long way to go to compete with pump storage hydro. And this is just some of the basics that um, you're either using renewable energy or low cost off peak energy and then you're making the energy when the electricity is needed the most, when the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining and when the demand is really high. And so this is uh, what enabled that legislation last year that basically declared it in the public necessity in the, in the coal field region of Virginia. And here are a couple of slides from Dominion storyboards that uh, show the location. The, the one that Delegate Kilgore was talking about in Y is the bullet mine site. You can see the general location of that. And then um, there's another site in Taswell that would be a more conventional project similar to the Bath project, just not too big. And here are some very impressive economic impacts of this project, both under construction and after it operates with respect to, to jobs and local revenue. Um, here are some of the site selections. These are hard to see, so I'm hoping if some of y'all are interested in this, when you download, you can probably get the presentation. You can look at the details. Also, Dominion's got a, a, um, a booth in there that has some of these storyboards up on display if you want, if you want to take a look at those. And so this just talks about the development, what's gone through with the development of site selection and preliminary design. Right now, the, the Virginia Tech is doing a, a desktop study. Um, this is just the process for permit approvals. And here is some information on the Taswell site. gives a better idea of the location. You can see the three reservoirs that represent either upper or lower reservoirs. And again, the ultimate battery, you can't uh, fish a canoe on a battery, so it would provide some really nice recreational activities as well. And then this is just talking about the retired mine site, the bullet mine site in Wise County. Um, it's got an incredible amount of water, very, very clean water, we really don't have the problem with acid mine drainage in Virginia that some of the other states do. The desktop study is considering that, looking at what cycling the water up and down would do. Would that create more acid mine water in the mine? That's, that's one of the considerations. But um, right now, it looks like that would be a really good source of water for a potential closed loop pumped hydro system where you take the mine pool water pump it up to the surface and then run it back through the turbines back into the mine pool and so it's just a closed loop continuous system. And there is the location within Wise County again talks a little bit about what Virginia Tech's doing in the, in the study that they're working on with the impact of water quality and water cycling within the mine and how it affects mine stability. And um, here is just a concept from the Germany based project and as you can see, they're using a mine. They've got an upper reservoir on the surface. They've got wind turbines and solar panels. And look, they got, it looks like a switch grass uh, biomass. Stuck over the corner. Yeah, stuck over the corner. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to anaerobically digest the switch grass. Uh, real quick, I'm going to finish with the commercial pace program. This is something that might be interesting. You know, this is something that 
the locality has to enable, um, and basically what the locality does is they, they, they set up um, both lenders and contractors, and they can do this through a third party administrator, hired administrator to do this for them. You get lenders and contractors, and you improve your building stock by doing uh, improvements to your commercial building stock. And the lenders work with the, with the locality, and the payment is repaid through um, property tax assessment. And so it's a way that the localities can get involved and help drive improving the building stock in their commercial and business districts. Um, it's worked really well in some other states. And, uh, and we're kicking it off here in Virginia. And so um, we're really hoping that the localities get interested in this and start pursuing this. And we've got some people in DMME. The last slide is contact information for Dan, if y'all have more questions. But it was enabled through legislation. Again, it's, uh, it's, it's paid for through a collection of uh, tax assessments. It does have to get subordinated to the mortgage, but that's something that apparently has not been a showstopper in other uh, states where it's um, been implemented. Creates jobs, improves the building stock, makes the buildings in your locality worth more. Um, there's no out-of-pocket expenses. The building owner can, can initiate these projects without having any out-of-pocket expenses. And there's just a diagram of, uh, of the steps that you have to go through in order to get a C-PACE loan. So Arlington, I know that Arlington's not here, but um, Arlington... Yes, we are. Oh, you are? And hey. we're very excited. Yes, okay, well, I'm glad Arlington's in here. So I, I would encourage you to help educate your... Uh, your peers in the room on how this works because we're excited that y'all are doing it too. And we're, we're taking it up at Saturday's board meeting. Okay, that's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. So y'all know who to talk to now if you want to. If you want to talk to the subject matter expert because I know just enough. And there's the DMME contact. So um, if y'all are interested, you talk to Arlington, and when you're done talking to Arlington, give uh, give Dan a call. Okay. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, Steve, I'm going to show you. Oh, is this what I'm supposed to do? Yeah. <laughs> well, John, since you got all excited now, you can go ahead and first the first Sure. So, um, John Weistad, Arlington County. So, um, we are excited about the commercial PACE program, but my question actually relates to solar energy. And you had a couple slides on net metering and talking about residential use of solar energy. and. Uh, in Northern Virginia, we are hearing some rumblings that Dominion Virginia Power is thinking of altering uh, the net metering protocol such that it would disincentivize uh, homeowners from converting to solar. And number one, I'm curious to know whether you're hearing any of that. Number two, if, if, if Dominion were to, to do that, would they need approval of the state corporation commission or how would they effectuate this because I mean that is not going to be a popular initiative if they try to take that on in Arlington for one. Yeah I, I would say that I'll just in full disclosure that net metering is not one of the most popular programs for the utilities but they understand that it is an important program that gets addressed through that Rubin group Net metering was not one of their topics, and so yes, it would have to be approved through legislation. And if they were going to do that, they would have put it in front of that Rubin group. So you, again, you might want to take a look at getting to the details of what the Rubin group is working on, and you can find out more about what they're looking at. But as far as I know, they're not talking about making net metering any more difficult for for homeowners. <laughs> Okay, but John, what would it would they to do that? Would they need both legislation and regulatory approval for the for, through the state corporation commission, or just legislation? The you know, legislation yeah. would drive it. Whether there would have to be some follow-up procedural or administrative work done by the state corporation commission, and it, so it may be both. But right. the 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 gating item would be the legislation. You couldn't do regulation without the legislation. Okay. There may be some regulation follow up as a result of the process. Thank you. That's right. Yes, sir. Um, 
I, I wanted to visit, revisit this pump storage hydro uh, project. You alluded to water recreational activities, but I thought that the diagram of this this wet, this uh, mine would just be a vertical yeah. transport system. So yeah, in the in the retired mine, in the bullet mine case, you would use a surface, and that would not. It would be a much smaller project too. I think that the you know a, a mine would be 150 megawatts, where a the, the project in Tazewell would be much much larger, require much more larger bodies of water that would lend themselves to recreation. These activities. projects only provide peak peak capacity. That's the whole hard right. Part. Yes. And I they remember don't... as a young student at Virginia Tech protesting against damming the new river for pumping storage. <laughs> and remember, these don't dam, these don't dam rivers. So yeah, the one, you build, you build, you build like a great Yeah, idea. and in fact, the one, yeah. <laughs> I was going to go back to it, the one in, um, in Tazewell, the, that one, that, that red, yellow line there, the actually, well, yeah, that's a pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pipeline back, no, back to a box. <laughs> it's a water line. It's a water okay. line to get water from a... From I'm a not with him, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just say that? But it follows a, uh, a, an electrical right-of-way, so it doesn't create any new right-of-ways or any new um, disturbance with making a new right-of-way. And it gets water from a mine instead of damming a river. Thank you. Yeah, Steve, um, that switchgrass situation, what did you have to do to convert the boilers in those two facilities? Actually, I, I, I really hate to say this since I'm a Republican up here, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, um, um, Senator McCain, I mean, at the time he was governor, right. he, he applied, he, we got some money from the federal government, so we got a biofuel boiler for like, uh, I think we ended up getting a like $750,000. And then the state did kick in and, and help pay for the rest of the bowl, so we're very thankful. That. But that's what we ended up doing. So you had to convert, you had to Yeah, you know, really, I had, it was kind of the perfect storm going on. The, right. like, we got the money for the bowl at the same time. We discovered the switchgrass. We, you know, we still, we burned sawdust. We were burning sawdust before they uh, started that. And um, it just kind of gave you an idea. It's, we figured it's going to take somewhere about 2,000 acres to supply steam for the um, Piedmont Hospital and BCBR, which is a sexual predator. Um, you know, that was kind of a black eye for Nottawa County also, but, you know, but it's been, it has brought jobs there. And now, now they're building a, it's going to be a piece of too, I think it's an addition going on to that, so, right. which is going to require more steam production. Yes? Uh, you, there was a slide there that said something about the build out at 29,000 acres. Uh, but what, what is, what would be the, for the solar panels? What, what are we looking at in the total build out of the demand that exists uh, for the state of Virginia. Yeah, well, if you look at the 500 megawatts declared in the public interest, and if you say, okay, I'll seven acres a megawatt, so what's that, 3,500 acres? Uh, but there might be, it just depends. It depends on what the appetite for the industry is and, and how much the consumer drives that. So just because there's been so much declared in the public interest doesn't mean that more of that's not going to happen or that less of that's going to happen. So it just, that's all market driven. That's kind of a crystal ball question. What if, if all the solar that was projected to be built, how much land would it take? It's, it's hard to tell because you'd have to know how much solar is going to be built. So, so no one's looking at what the potential consumption of agricultural land is. I'm not sure they are. What office did you say you were with? Because that was definitely a political answer you just gave. That was not a, a analytical answer whatsoever. There, what's in the public interest and what's being made, the applications that are being made by independent solar companies mm -hmm. right now, I think are going to far exceed anything around that 29,000 acres. I think that's what Mr. Walker was right, asking. So you think it's going but more than that? Just how many millions of acres are you looking at for these solar projects? Yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that question because again, that's all. It all depends on where the the market goes from here. Yes. All right. I know we got another question. Just just, just so Novaco also um, has uh, has an ad hoc committee. 
because of solar you know, power. And I'm on that committee also. Um, we saw one D Dominion Energy had put us something like 44,000 acres in the next 20 years. But, that's, but, but then I heard John say today, there's a lot of these applications not even getting approved. So I guess it is. But you're right. That, it can change pretty quick. So I agree with you. We need to keep out of that. But I think it's like a sleeping giant is what I feel like it is. Let me get this gentleman over here first now because he had put Sam yeah, um, I'm Joel Laker from Isle Wake County in the Windsor District, and we have one of the solar farms that are listed up there on the list of solar farms already in existence. In fact, it's actually a good friend of mine, a lifelong friend of mine's uh, farm that's on. But there's some unknowns, of course, in our, in our business being elected, you, we've got to deal with perception and those unknowns. And how you deal with unknowns is, is very difficult. So with the solar panel aspect in our county, I see that more farmers are becoming more interested in it. In our part of the county, we've got very fertile fuel, I mean, fuel, list of it, um, the soil. I mean, we're growing peanuts and we're growing cotton. Where other places, they're, soil, they're mainly just, you know, small grains, that kind of stuff. But we're converting it over to solar farms because of the stability of income for the farmers. And I can appreciate that. I can appreciate also the farmers being able to do what they want to with their land. On the same token, I am concerned, as with the farm that I just mentioned, one of the things that they look at is a family farm, been in a family farm for several generations. In their perception, and what they're being told, obviously, is that within a given amount of time, when the lease is up, as you indicated, it can be re returned back to farm use. I have to wonder, as we scale down our fossil fuel use and go to solar, and we let these plants come offline, when that time comes, 40, 50 years from now, whatever the term is, will they really be able to break this lease? I would argue that it's a good chance that for the best, for the, uh, for the best of everybody, that the government will probably step in and not allow them to take it offline and they will not get their farmland back. I don't say, I'm not trying to be a radical, but I guess my point is, what am I to tell my constituents when they're saying, first of all, they don't want it in their backyard, they're worried about soil contamination, if any of these panels are compromised during that 20, 30 years on the property. Um, they're also concerned, maybe they're, they're buying into the fact that one day it can be returned to farmland for their generations to look at or what have you. Um, and, I, and I know that these are questions that are easily asked. I guess I, I introduced myself, so I'm online if anybody can give me any feedback at all so I can better educate my public. Because like I said, we've got other farmers that are looking at this as a, as a steady source of income. And with some generations not wanting to farm right now, it's also an option. And I just want to be very responsible. And, and you were talking about acreage. This particular site is 215 acres, only 110 are actual solar panels, and it's only doing 20 megawatts. And to my knowledge, we get no M and T tax off that at all. So anyway, I just okay. want to leave that out. There. Well, great stuff, and we appreciate you um, commenting on that. And I'm sure there's going to be questions that we can't answer, and we'll try to get one more question. We'll ask you. Dan Taft, Mecklenburg County. We've been overwhelmed with requests for solar farms, and I'm sure it's a lot of other counties in it at all too. Um, we had approved two smaller scale solar farms on roughly two to three hundred acre plots. Last Monday we approved an 80 megawatt site on a 980 acre farm. Uh, land use of course was a big issue uh, in this whole debate. It's been very controversial. Uh, it's only the second time in my 18 years on the board that the board voted against a request of the planning commission. They voted not to approve, right. we voted to approve. Um, we've heard the gamut that was just mentioned before, what's going to happen 30 years down the road. In our county, nobody's leasing land, though they're selling. You know, they're asking, they're getting three times the value of the profit from these solar companies. Um, you know, we hear the horror stories that, that you know, how are you going to stop this train? Uh, you know, you have to do them one at a time. Nobody else is in front of our planning commission right now with the request. But, you know, living around two large lakes in South South Virginia like we do, Dominion happened in the one of them, the uh, Lake Afton and family. Uh, all the counties around us that border those uh, lakes are really going to be hit with it. And with John H. Kerr Reservoir, Bugs Island Lake, in our county, uh, we have just all these transmission lines that these solar companies are looking for. Right. Uh, ironically, in our county, 
most of the, uh, all of the quests so far have been around one town, Shea City. And they've all been in the county. Um, but again, it's a very controversial thing. Land yeah. use issues are going to continue to come up on that. And, um, you know, these power companies are driven by the Clean Energy Act to produce 15% of their electricity from, from clean energy. I mean, look at the fight that's going on in Virginia over natural gas right now. Right. To, uh, to power these plants. So this is something that's not going away. I mean, if it hadn't come to your county yet, you better well, get ready. I, I'm There's just a lot of land use issues there. And you right. really need to look at your zoning and your ordinances. And because, you know, we've had to step back from it a little bit right. before we did that because we weren't ready. But Dan, you made a good point. Not only county, not only planning commission. The word solar power, solar is not even in, was it even in the zoning? And um, so we we had to add that on. Well, listen, we got built up time now. Um, I thought I thought something that um, uh, Delegate Terry Gil Gilford said was very important when he first started. He was talking about his kids leaving the TV on, and, and somebody said, "Well, this is a train. You just use that. You know, how are we gonna stop this train? Well, what's causing the train? Energy." So I'm just going to ask you right now, just real quick. How many of y'all left the light on in your room, or the TV on, or the heater on? Raise your hand. Yeah, go ahead and confess it. All right, so we all, you know, and it's, it's, America's the greatest place in the world we live, but we are wasteful people, and um, that's something that we need to concentrate on so, so we can slow that train up a little bit. Um, but we, it was some good stuff, and please give our guests a big hand here for um, these people.